My name is Matt Durden and I'm from the Library of Congress. I'm with the Library of Congress Veteran History Project. Bellevue University is a sponsor of the Nebraska Vietnam Veteran Memorial Foundation. I am here at the 38th Annual Vietnam Veteran Reunion with Army Veteran Larry Sabata, Sabata who has agreed to share their story for the History Project and the Nebraska Vietnam Veteran Memorial Foundation. So Larry, let's begin with your, firm, your full name and where you were born. My name's Larry J. Sabata. I was born in David City, Nebraska. And uh, growing up in uh, David City, can you tell us a little bit about your family? Yeah, I grew up on a farm uh, east of David City and we mostly raised corn, soybeans, and alfalfa. Uh, as a young kid, uh, I walked to soybean fields, did some detasseling, and a lot of baling and everything. Yeah, it's not like the kids nowadays that are probably sitting at home or in the basement, you know, playing their video games. You know, we were out there kind of working all the time, you know. We weren't afraid to drink uh, water from a hose and get our hands dirty. And uh, that's what I grew up in a, uh, you know, agriculture atmosphere and had a good upbringing. Great. Um, how did your parents feel and your family feel about uh, you joining the service? Uh, well, I really did join. I was drafted. Oh, okay. And, uh, my draft number was number 11, and so I, I knew I, I would be going, you know. That uh, uh, wasn't the best number to have. <laughs> um, so as, uh, as you were drafted, did, it, or did any of your other family or siblings uh, join or get drafted as well during that time? No, no, I was the only one. My brother was older he uh, missed uh, uh, Vietnam and my sister was younger of course and they can were you, drafting women. <laughs> can you tell me again when you were drafted? Yeah I was uh, drafted uh, in uh, August uh, August uh, 19th of uh, 69 and I got out uh, May uh, 28th of 71. Okay. Um, so where did you go to uh, basic training? I went to Fort Lewis, Washington. And usually the people that went to Fort Lewis, Washington, you're just about guaranteed your next de destination is going to be Vietnam. And what did you... Uh, when you went after BMT, what did you, where did you go for your training? Okay, my basic NAIT was both at uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. And what field did you go into? I was a uh, uh, Lab and Bravo Infantry. How long was that training? Oh, I think a couple months. <clears throat> All right, I just make sure just a couple of months and you went straight to Vietnam from there? That's correct. When, uh, roughly what time, uh, what? Well, I gotta back up on this. Well, you know, with basic and AIT, I think it was three, uh, three four months, you know, and then went to Nam. So in the winter, uh, roughly fall, winter? Yeah, I uh, left uh, in, uh, January of uh, 1970. So can you tell me a little bit about uh, your experience coming into country? How was it stepping off the plane? Well, coming from Nebraska where in January, you know, I got to go, to, go home for a short time uh, before I left for Vietnam. 
and uh, in January in Nebraska it can get quite cold and then when I arrived just, a, just about halfway around the world I think from Nebraska it was about nine or ten thousand miles <clears throat> stepped off uh, the aircraft there landed in uh, Tonsonu, uh, Saigon now Ho Chi Minh City uh, walked out and I just felt the uh, felt the heat and humidity, you know, just whoosh like that. A stark and difference. A big time, yes. So even in uh, in the, the the dead of winter, that heat will still hit you. Oh yeah, that was a big change, you know. Can we, a lot of people tell us about the the, the smell of that first smell of stepping on soil in in country. Did that leave a, a resonating experience with you? Yeah, kind of. You know, you could smell, especially when I went to my uh, first uh, uh, base camp, you know, well, uh, Mama San, you know, burning in the fire pits and everything, and uh, uh, it, it had a unique smell. <laughs> So okay, so you uh, so you're going to your first your first base camp, right? How was the experience going there? We uh, rode on a deuce and a half uh, to I was with the Ninth uh, Infantry, and I was down in the Adela near uh, Tan An, Tan Tru, and. My experience uh, there, you know, I see, well, just mostly lots of rice patties and everything and water buffalo and, you know, people working, you know, the old uh, uh, oxen and everything or just like stepping back, you know, a couple, couple decades way, way back, you know, that, you know, in Nebraska, you know, we had mechanized machinery and everything. And everything there was all done by water buffalo and everything. And it was, most people were hard workers. You know, they had a rough life. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good observation of understanding what it was like that. Starkly different. Way different. How was the accommodations for you on that base camp? Not bad. You know, that was kind of our rear at... Uh, uh, Tan An, yeah, we had a regular uh, 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 building, you know, other than later on, you know, when we were mostly out uh, in the uh, rice paddies, you know, well, we didn't, we didn't get back to our rear barracks that often, you know. So, while you, when you were in the country, as you arrived in the country, can you, Tell us uh, what kind of routine kind of built up for you. Well, I was assigned, uh, 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 as noted on my DD-214, DD I was uh, expert M-14, expert M-16, expert uh, 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 45, pistol and expert uh, M60 machine gun and so you can about imagine what they gave me they gave me the M60 machine gun and so yeah I that was quite a weapon I I shot I shot thousands of rounds through that baby and uh, yeah but it got me back home can you tell us a little bit of more in detail with uh, putting the thousand around, thousands of rounds through that? Yeah, well, I had an assistant machine gunner, and we change out barrels. You know, sometimes the barrel would you know, get hot. You know, now I don't want to give the wrong impression here that those thousands of rounds, you know, hit the Viet Cong or the NVA. You know, there was a lot of times, you know, we didn't actually know that we were uh, shooting at just laying down ground fire, you know. 
especially when we're in the jungles away from the rice paddies and sometimes that uh, barrel gets so hot that well actually that's where I picked up smoking you could uh, put your cigarette you know uh, near the front of the receiver there and you could just about light your cigarette off of it and then a lot of times what we call a hot fire cook off you can leave your finger off the trigger in in the chamber where it feed in it was so hot it would ignite uh, uh, the powder in the rounds and it just keep on firing and the only way to stop the M60 was you take the belt and just rip it off you know and you know uh, deprive it of ammunition and that's where you stop the M60 yeah sometimes uh, yeah lots of rounds did you have any stories you wanted to talk about specific to uh, that first assignment uh, yeah, I I carried a Super 8 uh, movie camera in uh, Vietnam, and I got a hour and 15 minutes of edited film. And it wasn't until about six, seven years ago, I took that edited film up here to Omaha to have it uh, uh, put to. Uh, on a, on a DVD, on a disc, and uh, the guy looking at it, you know, uh, surprisingly, my film, Super 8, uh, a movie film, was in really pretty good shape. He says, you must have taken care of these, and I says, yeah, I have them a cool place in the closet, and we went through it, you know, and after it was all done and the editing was done, we had to edit it, some of it, you know, you know, we had to. And he says, he says, Larry, he says, you don't know what you have here. I says, I says, oh yes I do. It's my tour of Vietnam and Cambodia. And he just shook his head. He says, I never seen anything like this. And so that's uh, uh, kind of my story, you know, of Vietnam. Uh, I guess one thing that uh, uh, I can relate to, uh, theoretically, I was with three different units. I was with the 1st Infantry Division coming in in 1970, and the colors were going back to uh, 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 Kansas, Fort Riley, Kansas. And so that's when I got uh, put in the uh, 9th Infantry and then uh, uh, Ninth Infantry. Then I went to the twenty, the second of the twenty-fifth Infantry, and so I was all the way from down to the Delta, as far as north as Kantum. And so uh, my area of uh, where I seen in Vietnam was quite a bit. Never did a whole lot, you know, in I Corps, but in Second Corps, Third Corps, all down, you know. I got to see quite a bit of the country. Uh, when I was mostly with the 25th, uh, we're more or less the air mobile uh, with the air cab and our, on the Hueys and everything, our choppers on the front there, it said the Ghost Riders. And that was our kind of our uh, taxi of the air, in the air, you know. And so they drop us off at point A and We'll see you boys at point B, you know, hopefully, and huh, I got to hand it to those pilots, you know, they're really amazing. Having seen just a small clip of the Super 8 uh, video that you had taken uh, there, it, it's pretty remarkable, the shape it's in, but it also kind of outlined just the clip I saw of, uh, of a younger you. Can you tell me, having that Super 8, was that one of your, uh, ha you know, best recollections, or was there uh, other recollections of great experiences that you had that you'd like to share? I have one that kind of haunt, uh, haunted me for okay. a long, long time. Had problems with it. Uh, 
I was, like I said, I was an M60 machine gunner, and then I was a mechanical ambush setup man. And what the mechanical ambush was, uh, we'd set up uh, Claymore mines, you know, to the uh, on a trail or, or any type of path. You know, it set one in the front, back, and then the side. And then it was triggered uh, w with a small battery through a trip string that was camouflaged and everything. Well, this was one time uh, my buddy and I that uh, helped me set up uh, uh, the mechanical ambushes, you know. Uh, we, we, we set it up and we'd always kind of draw a little sketch of where it was exactly at. And so uh, uh, the following day, you know, we, we set it up uh, towards the evening and then the next day, you know, we went to dismantle it. And it was my turn to dismantle it, the uh, mechanical ambush. And anyway, our, our head NCO says, uh, says uh, Larry, I, I need to talk to you. And so uh, uh, I went to talk to him. I said, well, sir, I want to I gotta, uh, dis, uh, disengage the mechanical ambush. And uh, uh, my assistant on the mechanical ambush says, no, Larry, I'll, I'll, I'll disengage it. No problem. Go, go, go see, go see what Sarge wants, you know. So about, so about uh, oh, 10 minutes later, heard a big explosion. And I kind of knew exactly what it was. And what happened, what happened was, I guess Charlie was watching us where we set up the mechanical ambush, okay? As I looked on my map, you know, on the different, you know, the trees and everything marked and everything, where it was over here, well, Charlie uh, moved the mechanical ambush about 100 yards up the trail. So he, he, here's, my, here's my friend, you know, that went to uh, disarm the mechanical ambush, thinking it was <clears throat> clear down there. We walked in, he walked in our own ambush. And that, bo that bothered me for a long freaking time. You know, that should have been me. Not him, it was my turn. That should have been freaking me. Well, it wasn't. So I don't know if the guy up there says, well, I got different plans for you, Larry. And so, well, I made it back. So, here, you know, here I am. But uh, that hurt. Yeah, there's a lot of good stories and a lot of not so good stories. Uh, I can say, uh, even though it was on Poplar Ward, I realize that. I still serve my country and I'm proud that I did. And people ask me, would I do it again? You know, I think I would, you know, if it make any difference, you know, to <clears throat> save our country. Because right now, I really don't like the direction we're heading. But I'm not going to get political here, okay? Well, do you re recall the your assistant's name? Yeah, Melvin Witcher. good to mention it and I hope it, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. it takes a little bit of that burden off. Um, do you recall any uh, any times, uh, like humorous times, uh, some good memories that you had that... Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I can remember uh, uh, sometimes when we <coughs> uh, run out of uh, sea rations we were in an area where we really couldn't get the choppers in to resupply us and then we went to a friendly village and we kind of shared you know food with them you know and 
their food is a little bit different than <laughs> than ours and everything, you know. I heard, you know, that uh, uh, you know, you never seen no overweight dogs there or anything, or you know, it was monkeys and all that stuff. And uh, uh, what I really kind of enjoyed was uh, fish heads and rice. You know, it's not as bad as what you think. You know, the fish heads, you know, were fried in a, like a a, 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 a a wok. You know, it'd be just nice and crispy and everything. And, <clears throat> when you're, it wasn't bad at all. You know, it sure was a stark difference. <laughs> than well, the sea yeah, rats well, thing, yeah, right. right, correct. Yeah, it, it was, it was. And then good times, you know, I did get to go on R and R. Went to uh, Sydney, Australia, and that was really neat. That 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 was okay. Um, any fun stories uh, from R and R? Uh, no, I liked, uh, well, I went to King's Cross area, and that's kind of the red light district, and believe it or not, you know, that wasn't really for me, you know, and you know, probably guys, you know, saying, well, what's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with me. He just, you know, uh, went to the Texas Tavern. In my understanding, the guy that opened up the Texas Tavern in uh, uh, King's Crossing in Sydney there. Uh, he, he was a Vietnam veteran from, you know, early, you know. And he went to Australia and he says, there's, he probably thought there's money to be made here. And he called the Texas Tavern. And that place was just packed. Uh, uh, GIs going and everything. So, he was on to some. I, I went to Bondi Beach and did a lot of swimming and everything and met some real nice people. and. Uh, I, I really enjoyed myself. Now I don't know if, if this is going to be edited, but uh, uh, some of it, which I think it might be. But when I went on the aircraft to uh, uh, to go to Sydney, Australia, there's four guys that I knew, and they says. Uh, Larry says we're not coming back. We're not. We're not going back to now. Because you know we kind of knew we we're going to go into Campbell. It's just we're not going to do it. And so when my week was up, and uh, gosh darn, you know that same plane, you know, there was those four empty seats. They're probably. In Australia right now with a big family. I don't know. They never did come back. <laughs> How long was uh, R and R? How long was that? Seven days. Seven days. Yep. So, um, did you have any experiences uh, as you returned from your service? That looks like. Oh. I'm Did you have any experiences that you uh, coming home? Coming home. Yes. Uh, of course, in 1970, you know, we had a mag magazine, Army magazine, it was called the Stars and Stripes. And uh, uh, anyway, you know, when I'd have the opportunity, when we get to. Uh, uh, our rear rear, which was at Coochie, that was with the 25th, our, our rear, you know, I'd read it, you know, and I never heard about Kent State that uh, uh, happened in 1970. And then, anyway, when I came home from Vietnam, landed in uh, Oakland, California, Oakland, San Francisco there. You know, seen all these protesters and everything, and they weren't nice. You know, they, they tried to actually spit on you. You know, and so there was, well, there was, you know, uh, uh, guards there and everything to shoo them away. But all sides of protesters and baby killers and everything like that. And I said, uh, I, I didn't know, you know, what was all going on here in the United States. Because you know they they're not going to publicize that to a guy that's 
in Vietnam. And so that, you know, made me think a little bit, you know, what's happening back here. And then, then I was told about Kent State, where our own National Guard, you know, killed a few uh, students and everything. And I thought, what the hell's happening, you know? And so, yeah. But uh, uh, then we were told that uh, when you get off, you know, change your clothes as soon as possible. You know, don't go out in your fatigues or anything like that. Just go back to your civvy clothes, because we didn't get the welcome home like the World War II vets that, in my opinion, wouldn't be for the World War II vets. You wouldn't be here interviewing me. You know, this would be a totally different world. So my greatest respect goes out to the World War II vets, you know. Even though, you know, like they say, war is hell and combat is combat. I was going to say a bad word, but I'm not going to do it. And, so, but uh, my, my heart goes out to the World War II vet. So how long were you there in Oakland, San Francisco area before you transitioned all the way home? I went, uh, I was there about six, seven hours and hopped the next plane uh, back into Omaha. Was your family waiting for you there? Yes. And welcome home, Larry. And then on on the farm out there, had uh, uh, welcome home signs and everything. And people, David said he, you know, welcomed me. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, farming community. We were, it wasn't like what you see in the big cities and everything. They just no, we we were welcomed. You know, that was good. And the biggest welcome was, uh, for me, many, many, many years later. You know, with Williams, you know, with uh, Patriotic Productions, you know, I got on that uh, uh, combat uh, uh, infantry flight uh, uh, to the wall there. And I told the wife, I says, you know, I don't know if I can handle this. You know, at the last minute, <clears throat> uh, I didn't want to go. And, and my wife says, you're going to go. Uh, but she went to uh, also with the women's group and so I went to vit visit the names that I have on that wall and I'm not ashamed to admit it when I touched that wall I just kind of broke down and cried a little bit and I put my hand up against some the, a name or names and everything and I just felt a rush, just a, a calm, a peace, you know. Like those guys said, well, we're waiting for you. You know, it says, you're okay. We'll be waiting for you. And when I left there, you know, I was at ease. It was really a different experience, to say the least. So when, uh, when did that happen? When did you go see the wall? God, you know, I kind of, it was two, three years ago. I'd have to, I'd have to look that up. Uh, it was, I was with the blue team, uh, the combat uh, uh, infantry, you know, us guys. We were the first, you, the first uh, group to fly over there. Mm -hmm. You had the uh, blue team, the white team, the red team. I was the blue. I think that was four or five years ago. I'd have to have to look it up. You know, I just well, it's a long time to hold that burden and to get it to yeah, that relief. It, 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 was, it was, it was, it was, it was. Weight off of your shoulders yeah. to think. And then when we arrived at the airport, uh, 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 here in Omaha, not hundreds of people. It was thousands of people. If you'd look it up in the archives, in the uh, I'm all World Herald, you could find articles on it, you know, for a channel six or seven or three. Yeah, we had bands and everything and everybody cheering and clapping and that really felt kind of good. It was the welcome home that you needed. Yes, that's right, that we never 30, really got. 40, you know. 
Yeah, well, just about like 50. 50. Yeah, 50 that's years right. Earlier. Yeah. Well, was there any other uh, stories that you'd like to share? Oh, let me think a little bit. Made made friends that you know I try to keep in touch with uh, today. That we're closer than my brother and I, you know, because we depended on each other and uh, uh, made a lot of good friends in uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, we all looked out for each other, and most of us made it back, but. Not all of us. You know. Are there other organizations or other uh, gathering events that you that you remember? Or oh yeah, I'm in? I'm uh, 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 District 15 uh, VFW service officer. Been that for quite a, uh, for quite a few years, and then uh, also uh, I just got re uh, relieved. Uh, uh, Hello, the VFW, I was commander of uh, our VFW post in David City, 5814. I was commander for 35 straight years. And so that was a long time for that to be a commander for 35 straight years. It's got to be a record and, somewhere. Yeah, it, it is. It is. And so the guy that took over for me, I said, it's about time somebody else takes over. And the guy that took over for me, uh, he was a little bit older than I was. And I says, I says, Don, I says, you got to do me one favor. And I just sort of relinquished that command uh, just last year. And I says, you got to do one favor for me, Don. And he says, what is that? And I says, you got to try and beat my record of 35 years. And would that put him at 110 or 112 years old? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. He just kind of laughed, everybody laughed, you know. And so I do help a lot of veterans, a lot of veterans. And I'm proud to do it, you know. I'm mostly, sure mostly I go through, I go through Barry Law. I, I know John, John Barry personally and everything. In fact, on some of his uh, advertising, on his snips on, that you'll see on TV, you'll see some of my footage that he took from my uh, DVD, and he asked if I could use it, and I said, yeah, I can use it, it's fine. Was that video, with the footage that you uh, have, was that put in any type of archive or published? No. Have you considered it, sharing that? I probably would the, the edited version, but not the full version. I, I won't do it. No, that's it. I understand. <laughs> so, uh, one last question before I ask uh, if you, uh, for any cl uh, for any sharing remarks, did you? Uh, is there anything you'd like to share for any future generations who will be watching this video of your military experience and? words of wisdom, so to speak? Boy, uh, I have to think about that one a little bit. Well, I'd say love and defend your country uh, under any circumstances. Uh, don't be afraid to stand up for your rights and watch out for a type of government that will try indirectly to try and take your freedoms and rights as we still have them right now. Because uh, you look at a lot of countries that uh, uh, lost their rights and everything. Oh, that's why. Uh, that's why. Uh, they fled to the United States, or early immigrants, you know, uh, great grand grandparents and everything, great great, come here to the United States for better life. I don't want to see the United States come a banana republic or third world 
country. But like I said, I'm not going to get political here because you'd be spending another hour with me. I understand. <laughs> so, <laughs> your thoughts, uh, have you grown accustomed to eating fish heads and rice since you've come back uh, from the war? Have you had them again? Uh, rice, I love rice, but uh, uh, no fish heads, you know. But they weren't bad. Like I said, they weren't bad. Uh, well, if you had to take one thing away from Vietnam, I'm glad it's fish heads and <laughs> rice weren't so bad. No, it was not bad. I know my sea rations, uh, uh, my favorite was uh, turkey loaf. That was uh, 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 beanies and uh, uh, bean and weenies weren't too bad either. You know, that was okay, but turkey loaf was my best. But the eggs, you know, they'd be green eggs, you know, that was a little different. But, well, when you're hungry, you ate, you know. Well, thank you again for taking the time to share your story. Sure. And recollections of your military experience. Um, if there's any last words you'd like to share? Uh, well, I'd say my most uh, area of operation was like I say around the Iron Triangle, uh, Parrot's Beak, and around a Black Virgin Mountain, Nui by Dead. And then there was one time we got on a caribou, I don't know if I mentioned this before, we flew north about for over an hour and a half. And you know what, to this day, you know, when we got off that aircraft, I must have been up there at i or someplace, because it was already mountainous, you know. But to this day, I really don't know where we're at. You know, just got on a caribou, and I figured the speed of that would have been 180 to 200 miles an hour on the caribou. You know, it was twin engine, and we flew for quite some time, so I tried to do the mat in my head. You know, what part of Vietnam am I going to? And yeah, I just don't know. You know, and we did see some skirmishes there, but not a whole lot. And if there's one thing I can bring up, you know, anybody that tells you that they uh, fought for their lives every day, you no, know, they're full of hooey. Uh, I went uh, for a month and probably three weeks, never fired a round. So it wasn't like World War II or the trench warfare over here where it just every day, every day, that didn't happen. Not to, not to me anyway. But I guess I'll challenge anybody that says, would say any different, because it, it was totally different, you know. Uh, when there was contact, it'd be, it wouldn't last more than 30, 36 minute, minute and a half. It was hit and miss, you know, Charlie. It just, you know, uh, just disappear. You know, just, uh, there's only, my whole tour in Vietnam, there was only two times that where it was a good battle. The rest was, you know, just sporadic fire and it disappeared either in an underground tunnel that was camouflaged, you know, where you couldn't see it, you probably walked right over him, you know. That was the deal on that. But uh, that's all I have to say on that. Well, thank you again. I you do bet. appreciate your time. Thank you for your service. Okay.